Today is April 19th, 2012. I'm at 375 Cole Street, Broomfield, Colorado, at the home of Tom Ryan. Mr. Ryan was born January 19th, 1932, in Miller's Falls, Massachusetts. This interview is in partnership with the American Patriots History and the Veterans History Project. Uh, Mr. Ryan, how would you like me to address you? Is Tom okay? Tom is fine with me. All right, Tom. I'm the interviewer and cameraman. My name is James P. Ryder. Uh, Tom, talk a little bit about your home, uh, where you grew up, what kind of uh, family life and environment you had. Well, we lived in a, a house with my, uh, my grandmother and her son, which was my mother's brother, on the first level on one side of the house, and we lived on the other. And then another one of my mother's sisters, lived upstairs, and uh, her last name was Fowler, Gertrude Fowler was her name. And there were three families in there, we were poor. We had one st stove in the house on our side to heat up the whole house, and that was in the living room. And the only way to ge get heat up to the second floor is they had a hole in the floor. And what little heat come up there, that's all you got. But in winter time, we'd have two, three, four blankets on. We got really cold, and it was an old uh, coal burning stove. And, but it heated the whole down downstairs, and we had a kerosene stove for the kitchen. My mother cooked on, baked on, and let's see. We, I can remember every Monday was wash day in our house, so you better bring your dirty clothes down and put in the kitchen because that's where she set up the scrub board and the big tubs of hot water and all that, and, and I went to school and had a great high school, uh, grade school there, eight years, and today this one kid I, go, I went to school with him, he, is, uh, he lives in uh, Alabama now, and uh, him and I went to grade school, and we went to high school together, and then we met one another going to our high school reunions after 35 years. And uh, to this day, in fact, I just talked to him here this past week, and uh, uh, he's having a reunion down in Colorado Springs uh, the second weekend of September, and he invited my wife and I down there for uh, for the big dinner, big buffet dinner, or whatever they have down there. And uh, so I am, so there's a couple other deals I got going in the month. You know, you, you always say when you retire, you don't have much to do, but... but uh, in September, my grandson joins the Air Force in in July, and he'll be in boot camp, uh, basic training down at uh, Lackland Air Force in Texas. And hopefully, Kay and I are going to be able to go down and see him graduate. And then uh, we're going to that uh, a Navy reunion, my Navy reunion, MCB 11, out in Port Wenemi, California, from the 23rd to the 27th of uh, September. With all of my old friends I met last uh, last year in Nashville, so uh, we correspond back and forth, and I do with six or eight people, you know. But uh, you enlisted in uh, the service, didn't you? Yeah, well, I enlisted November seventh, nineteen fifty. It was on a Wednesday. Did your upbringing um, have any influence over you enlisting? Your family, uh, military family, at all? I had four brothers that was in the service: two in the army and two in the navy. So that must have had a lot to do with your decision making. That was part of it. The other part of it was, I graduated on June 15th of uh, 1950. The Korean War started June the 25th of 1950. And I asked my brothers about it. I said, oh, it'll be over within a couple of three months, you know. Well, it ended three years later. But anyways, uh, I had a friend that worked in the post office, and his name was Tommy, and I can't think of his last name. But anyways, I says, Tommy, have you been delivering any of these things from the Army, greetings and salutations? He says, yeah. I says, I delivered two last week and I just one this week. I says, well, do me a favor. I says, if you see one addressed to me, will you kind of kick it underneath the table and then call me? He said, you know, he didn't say yes, no. You know, so one Sunday night was, I don't know, probably two weeks later, a week later. Sunday night about 10.30, the phone rang. My mother yelled out to me upstairs. She says, Tommy, 
I'm down here, you got a phone call. I says, who the hell's calling this time? I thought you wanted me to go to work the next day. I says, uh, who is it? Tommy somebody. Oh yeah, I put my clothes on. Downstairs I went, you know. And I says, Tommy? He says, yep. Yeah. I said, what's the word? He says, go down to the Navy recruiting office in the morning and hung up. That's all he said. It's so a Monday morning, I rode over with this guy and uh, he dropped me off to the Navy recruiting office, filled out the papers and got me physical. Went back over there at Wednesday, jumped on the bus, went down to Spring Springfield, and took another physical and then we jumped on the bus and got down to Newport, Rhode Island about 10 o'clock at night. They fed us everything, took us over to the barracks and of course I didn't know this was going to happen but the guy took us over there and we had quite a few, I don't know if we had a full company yet. But anyway, I said, you guys just go ahead and sleep in. There'll be breakfast coming up and they'll call you around 10, 10 30 to get up. Well, at 5.30, there was about four guys coming through the barracks down there beating on trash cans at 5.30. Get your butts out, I'll take you down to breakfast. And that was my my real first day in the Navy, yeah, November the, the 7th, 1950. I was down there and in Newport from November until the 1st of February. I was in Company 67 down there. We had 120 people. And uh, Tell me a little bit about boot camp. What was, uh, what was training like then? You know, training was really a piece of cake. You know, I thought it was going to be rougher than it was. I thought there'd be a lot of physical stuff. Uh, we did a lot of marching. And at that time, we had supposedly, in, when you're in boot camp, you had, you had to wear those old leggings that you had to lace up, you know? Well, we had three chief petty officers <clears throat> from World War II, and they were assigned to push us through boots, you know? But anyways, the first day, we fall in, you know, and all that, and these three chiefs gathered us all around, 120 guys. He said, now there's three of us here, and he told me their names, and I forget them now. He said, but there's only going to be one chief here every day. The other two of us are going to be doing paperwork up at the CPO club, you know, paperwork, you know, <laughs> and so everybody just kind of laugh. But every every uh, Monday through Friday, every morning, one, one of those chiefs would be there, make sure everybody was there and everything, and that we had what they call a ACPO, Assistant Chief Petty Officer, and he was a, a, a young man that was left over from World War II and he come back in for the Korean War, and he was a seaman at the time, E3, and he was an ACPO, and I slept right above him, and uh, he was really good to me, throw me, showed me through a few uh, shortcuts on what to do, what not to do in boot camp, you know, and uh, I caught on real quick, and I, uh, I really had a good time in boot camp. I, I didn't realize that the United States stretched past the Hudson River, I didn't know there was anything, <laughs> and uh, we had, uh, we had people that were in from seven different states. Yeah, yeah, seven different states in our company alone, you know. And of course, listen to how those people talk from Pennsylvania and Ohio and Delaware and things like that. You know, I said, this is really a waiting for me because we used to sit down, we got all through a chow at night and do a little study, and you talk with all these people, and God, I tell you, you just can't believe how people from different parts of our United States how different they are, uh, their uh, values, uh, their jobs, what they do, and things like that. And uh, it was really interesting. And I, right then and there, I said, you know, if I keep t talking to people like you sitting right there, or no matter where it was at the time, I'm going to learn a lot. And I did. I could go up to the street. If I saw something about you, you know, out there in that car, and they probably go up and say, ah, can I help you? Is there somebody looking for him? Or something like that. And just start BSing with you. And you'd be surprised how many people I have met and talked to. And at one time, my grandson, who's in the Air Force Reserve right now, and he's the one over in Singapore, and him and I would go around. I'd take him around different places, you know, and I'd talk to people. You know, he, he said, Grandpa, he said, isn't that embarrassing? I says, no. Listen to these people, and you might learn some. We well, must have, because now he's a graduate from MIT, got his commission as a second lieutenant, got his master's, working on his doctorate. He'll be back from Singapore here the last of May, and uh, 
kid as smart as a whip. It's great to see that you've left that legacy and you've oh, yeah. Jeez, given I... him opportunities that, that you yourself never would have had. Yeah, I'm going to show you a piece of paper when Kay can back out. What he wrote about me when he was in uh, ROTC at MIT. Now, you ended up in the Seabees. Talk a little bit about how you ended up in the Seabees and describe a little bit what the Seabees are and what they do. Well, <clears throat> when I got out of boot camp, I was uh, F.A., a, a fireman apprentice. I had the red stripes. That means I, if I uh, stayed that way, I would work on the engine room on some kind of a ship or aircraft carrier or, or whatever. So I got down to... Uh, uh, Little Creek, Virginia, and I checked in at the receiving station over at Little Creek. And lo and behold, there was this third class wave petty officer sitting there. And she opened my record and she says, Tommy Ryan, do you remember me? I said, no. Have I seen you someplace? She said, yeah. I graduated a year before you did in high school. You used to play all the sports, didn't you? And I said, yeah. Right then and there, I knew I was I was home home free for a while. She said, "No, you don't want to go aboard ship, do you?" Said, no, not really. I said, "If you have something else," she said, "Well, I'll let you know." So she got me settled in the barracks, and I bust her every morning, and then I just kind of fiddle farted around and all that. And but took her out one night for the AM club and bought her a couple of beers, and we talked, you know. And so that Thursday after I checked in. She says, Tommy, she says, uh, after muster, she said, hang around me now, I've got to talk to you. It's okay. So she gave me a checkout slip. I had to check out of the receiving station before I could go to my next station. She said, here, go ahead and go around these places and get checked out and make sure they stamp it and initial it and all that. And I said, what's this for? She said, I got you a set of orders. I said, really? She said, yeah, just take your time because only about eight or ten places to check out, you know, like the library, the medical and all that. And so I did, you know. So Friday morning, after much of she says, uh, Tommy, hang on around, I want to talk to you a minute. I said, okay. She said, you go down, uh, go down to barracks here now and pack all your gear up because I got a set of orders for you. And it's not a ship, huh? She said, no. It's a staff over in the west annex of the Little Creek Amphibious Base. It was called Landing Ship Flotilla 2. And we used to take care of all of their supplies and everything for that. LSTs, LCUs, uh, LSM, LSMRs, and AVPs. They're all amphibious ships in, in the harbor there. And we used to supply them and everything. So this was going along okay until that September. They called me up to the personnel office and the yeoman says, uh, Ryan, he says, you got a set of orders. I said, I said Wait, where am I going? He said, well, he says, you're going to go to Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. And I says, for what? He says, you, I, if it's either BT or BR, it's going to something to do with boilers. And I looked at it, you know, I said, you know, I don't think this is right. He said, well, what's the matter? I said, well, I'll tell you what. That's a waste of the Navy's time, and it's a waste of my time to go to that school. So he said, well, you better go talk to the chief. So I went and talked to the chief, you know. Told him the same thing. He said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to become a CB because my uncle was a CB in World War II. He landed over D-Day. And he said, God, I, said, I haven't ever heard of them. He says, what do you want to be? And at that time it was called construction driver. So he looked it up, you know, and he said, yeah, here it is, construction driver. He schooled in Portland, Amy, California. He said, this is what you want? And I said, yes, sir. So sat down, filled the thing out, typed it up. I signed it, he signed it, took it across the hall to the personnel officer who was left over from World War II, and he was a Tom McCann shoe salesman before he went in the Navy. So he, he said, is this what you want to do, Ryan? I said, yes, sir, and he signed it. You know, he took me down to the XO, who was a full commander, another man left over from World War II. He said, I heard about you guys. He approved it. This was on Friday. He said, hold the chief, he says, now chief, make up a dispatch and send it up to Bupers today if you can. I says, commander, if he types it up and you already signed it, I'll take it over to communication. I had to go to NAS uh, Norfolk to get this communication sent up to DC. So they went over there and stamped it. He said, it'll be going out within the hour. 
this report. Was, so the following Friday, Chief called me up. He said, Ryan, I said, I better get over here. Got some bad news for you. And I said, oh, God, they disproved it. Walked up. He says, read that. See if you can read it. I can. You know, he's giving me a little BS job here. And I read it, and I says, California, isn't that where I want to go? Port Wanami? He said, yeah, I guess your orders. You leave next Friday. So I went out there and went through A school from uh, around the 1st of October to the 1st of February. And then went right back to the same base I was at down at Little Creek, but I was over at the main annex, that's where the Seabees were. And uh, I stayed there till 53, and then in 53, I went, September 53, I went to uh, Izmir, Turkey, and headquarters support activities from the, for NATO headquarters down there. That must have been an interesting place oh, to be. it was. Oh. So that was your first uh, chance to travel outside the U.S. was to be sent to place Tur like Turkey, of, of, of all things. Yeah. Uh, describe what that was like when you well, landed. Well, first of all, let me tell you how I got to Turkey. Now, you're not going to believe this. There was an Air Force base right up by where I, where I was born, Miller's Falls. And there was an Air Force base there. So anyways, I had my set of orders, and the guy said, well, he said, you can either go to uh, Pax River or go to McGuire Air Force Base or go to Westover Air Force Base and catch a ride over there. I said, well, send me up to Westover. You know, it's only about 35 miles from my house. He said, okay, so we'll give you oh, seven days and you check in. So went down there and checked in. And it was, I forget what day of the week it was. But the Air Force guy says, okay, go down and get a good meal and tell them you want a box lunch. And I says, for why? He said, well, this airplane you're going on is going to take a little while. And it was a C-124 double-decker cargo plane. So we left. Westover Air Force Base in Massachusetts by Springfield. We stopped in Argentia, Newfoundland. We stopped in the Azores. And we stopped in Casablanca. When I got to Casablanca, I said, when do we leave for Turkey? He said, this is as far as we go. We gotta go back to Westover. So anyways, went down to the customer service here and he said, well, so we'll find a flight for you, but it may take a few days. I said, okay. So they put me up in the barracks and weather was and I went down and bought me a swimming trunks and went down to the pool and stayed there for a week. He said, hey, they called me and said, hey, we got a flight for you in the morning. And I said, well, where's it going now? He says, Wheelers Field in Tripoli. I said, holy cow. He said, it's the best we can do. I said, okay. So I got on the plane. Same thing. I stayed there a week. And the guy says, Ryan, he says, we got a flight for you in the morning. I said, am I going to Turkey? He says, Pretty close, pretty close. I said, well, where? He went, got you a flight to Athens, Greece. Another week I spent there. I was almost running out of money. So anyways, they called me up on a Saturday morning. They said, get up here because we got a flight coming through. It's going right to Izmir, Turkey, where you want to go, and you're, you, we'll put you on it. I got on it, and there was only two of us on the airplane. One guy was coming from Naples, and I was there in Athens. So we got off the airplane in Izmir, Turkey, and I looked around and there was nothing. I mean, nothing out there, out in the boondocks. And they threw some mailbags out to me and this other guy, you know, and pulled up the ramp at the door and he took off. And I said, what do we do? He said, hell, I don't know. He was just a young kid like me. He said, I don't know. So pretty soon we looked and we saw this Navy truck coming up the road. I tell you, we were two happy sailors. So we loaded the mail in the truck and he, Took us down to a hotel and got us checked in and everything. Then that following Monday, I went to my my command. But it was good. It was it was a lot of fun working for the different uh, people, the di different armed forces, because it was at NATO headquarters down there. And the first one that I really took on a on a trip was on a uh, Sunday. I took a, a Greek general and his aide, who was a full bird colonel, and their wives, and we went up the coast of uh, Turkey for a while, for a ways, and we pulled up in there and there was an old battlefield, old buildings there and all that, you know, and it was a, it was a big Greek battle in, in the Romans many, many years ago, you know, and so they were up there just, you know, say that they went there, and so they had food for me and all right, and all that stuff, you know, but I didn't have anything to drink, so this general says, oh, you want, want some of the stuff that we drink? It was clear. I said, 
we are. Is that Ozo, I think is the name. Is that Greek liquor? And I said, okay. I took a sip of that and boy, gee, oh, I choked and choked. And those people were laughing at me, you know. Because you're always supposed to take a little sip of it. You know, I thought it was almost like water, you know. Like, oh. But they laughed and everything, you know. And we had a good time. I got them back to their, to their villas where they were living at, you know. But that was a good experience for me. So you probably didn't bring any Uzo back with you. That was, no. That was, that was your first experience and yeah, maybe your, yeah, when that, you were last. That, that never turned me on was that stuff. And then I I left there in June of uh, 54. I went back to Port Miami, California to B school. And then uh, I was there from uh, July until September. Then I went back to Davisville, Rhode Island for MCB8. And then we went to to Port Leone. We went into Casablanca first. I told us the guy I said, I've been here, done that, you know, you know, told him about it. But I stayed here for three months and I went to Malta. Yeah. And what I, did you do in Malta? <clears throat> I was attached to a uh, outfit called Fazron two oh one. Fazron stands for Fleet Air Service Squadron. And what we used to do is we used to uh, uh, service these uh, flights that come from Port Laoti to Malta to Naples. On, uh, they come through on Tuesday, on Thursday they come from Naples to Malta to back to Port Laoti. It was like a taxi service, you know. And then some of the ships would come in and we would have their mail for them or they'd give them supplies that they were running low and things like that. Did you have much chance <coughs> to interface with the uh, natives when you were there? When, For instance, when you were in Turkey, and I know you've traveled to other countries, did you have much opportunity? Oh, there? yeah. Yeah, we had... Uh, we probably had eight or ten uh, Turkish people, a couple of drivers and uh, and mechanics and everything. And uh, the general in the NATO headquarters, he was a, either a two or three star general. Well, we used to service his car and everything. And at night, if he wasn't going anyplace, he used to bring it down to our compound, would clean it up and all that, make sure it had gas. And he had a private, a Turk private, that could uh, speak good English and all that and knew everything about the whole city and everything. So he used to drive them around. And uh, <clears throat> I says, well, geez, how, how much do you get a month? He said, I want to get $28 a month. And I said, well, you want to make some extra money? Well, well yeah, how, how do I do it? I said, well, any weekend that you're not working for the general, you come down here and we have three or four or five guys that want to see part of Turkey. You know, he took us out to these different places. So one of the big places that he took us to is called Ephesus. I don't know if you ever heard of it. It's down on the southwestern coast. We went down there, and he told us the history about it. We ate down there. And then if you look out in the bay, you see St. Paul's prison. That's where St. Paul was in prison out there. And it showed the watermark on the side of this great big rock that was there was his prison. And uh, it was probably, geez, I'm thinking at least 20 feet high, maybe even longer, you know, where the water had receded, you know. And he says, yeah, when, when old Paul was there, that's where the water line was. And then we went back up into the hills a little bit, and we went to a, a, like a bunch of a, adobe buildings, like old Mexican buildings, but they weren't there from the Roman times, you know. And they took us in this one place. And this one place we had, where we went into, it was like a church. He says, you got to take your shoes off here, because it's, it's very sacred. <coughs> Excuse me. I said, well, what's so sacred about it? He said, they think this is the last place that the Blessed Mer Virgin Mary lived on earth. I couldn't believe it. God, it's just, it's so quiet and so serene here, I just couldn't believe it. And coming from Massachusetts and being able to see those things, that yeah. must have been yeah. quite a feeling for in you. In the five days I was in, in Athens, Greece now, I didn't have nothing to do. So this this girl at, at the hotel I was at, she could speak English, so she gave me a map and she mapped out the bus, the bus routes for me to take. I went out all over, all over Athens that, for that five days. Yeah, yeah. I, tell you, I, I heard about it. But to be there was something else, yeah. So after going to Greece and then to Turkey, and you mentioned Malta, where else did you get to travel? Thailand. 
And I, and tell tell me a little bit about Thailand. What, what were your impressions there? Okay, my experience is Thailand is is funny the way I got there. I was on uh, shore duty down in Sanford, Florida, which is about twenty miles north of Orlando, and. Uh, I was home one night and I uh, got a set of orders and it was to go to Guam to MCV-10 in Guam and at that time they were home based in Guam. So anyways I had a good friend that worked in the personnel office and he had just come from the personnel office in San Diego where the orders come out of. So I said, Bobby, I said, you know, could you help me out, you know, I really don't want to go to Guam, you know. And he said, well, so I'll tell you what you do. You tell your chief you're going to take the afternoon off, you got some personal business. Or the chief, I didn't have to tell him, I just told him I was going to go. So I went down, got a 12 pack of beer, went down to his house. And of course, the time change between Florida and California was three hours. He says, Well, I said, we'll just wait a little bit. So we had a couple of beer and he called his friend up, you know, told him what the, what the problem was. He, he says, Okay. Well, he had a copy of my orders. And they have numbers on them, you know, all different numbers and all that, you know. He said, read me these numbers or whatever they were, you know. He says, okay. He said, well, so we've got to hurry because he's going to be transferred a week from Friday, you know. I had about a week to, you know, get something squared away. He said, okay. So the day... Okay, so I was getting ready to get to check out the next day and uh, one night about 10.30, the officer of the day from the Naval Air Station called me up and wanted to know if I was Thomas Ryan, E01 and all that, and I, and I said, yeah. He said, well, I got a set of orders here for you. I said, well, tell me what they are. And he says, I can't. I said, well, why? He said, well, they're classified. He said, but if, if you come over here, I'll let you read them. I said, okay. So I got dressed and I came away. I said, where the hell are you going? You going over to have a beer at the AM club? I said, no, my orders are in. They changed my orders. I'm not. We're not going to Guam. So anyways, I went over there and read it. I'm going to go to Bangkok, Thailand for one year on a on a company tour. Oh, so I told her about it. She went up. I mean, I can't go. And I said, no, it's kind of classified. So I checked out and uh, went over. Went up to the receiving station in San Francisco for ten days, waiting for my passport to go to Thailand. And that was another good one of my deals. You muster in the morning, cause muster and make it, because you didn't have nothing to do. You just waiting for orders. So a bus bus, you know, we'd ride a Navy bus into San Francisco or on Treasure Island, go into San Francisco for the day, you know, and see the sights or whatever and all that, you know. And uh, that was really good. And one morning they called me and said, Ryan says you got to go up to Travis Air Force Base. We got your passport. You go in town and pick up your passport and. Flew to Thailand. We we stopped in. We went from uh, Travis Air Force Base to Hickam, Hawaii, to Midway, to Guam, and to the Philippines. And we get in the Philippines. We we, we traveled on um, Continental Airlines. The first there was their first flight to get military flights for them. So we get into uh, uh, the Air Force Base in the Philippines. And the plane breaks down, and there was you know probably a hundred and fifty of us on the plane or something like that. So this young airman, little E three or something like that, he said, "Well, so we'll just go ahead and put you guys in the barracks until your plane is fixed." And I had a master chief on there, and he, he looked at kid. He said, "Let me tell you something, sonny boy. You're not putting our our crew in the in the barracks. You're going to put us in a hotel, and the air force is going to pay for it." He said, I don't know. He said, well, that's the way it's going to be. Now, you want to get your supervisor, we'll get him, but that's the way it's going to be. He put us all on the bus, took us down to a hotel. We stayed there, I think, four days, three or four days before the plane got fixed. Went back out, got on the airplane. I flew into, from there, I flew into Saigon. I stayed there for a week, and then I flew over to Bangkok, stayed there a year. Um, and what year would this have been? 64, 1964. I got there in June of 64 and left in uh, the last of June of 65. And then I was uh, going to a SEATMA MCB-11 who was in Port Wanimi, California. So what I was going to do is they were going to put me on a commercial flight, you know. 
And I says, you know, every Tuesday and Thursday they have this flight come through. It's called the Embassy Flights. It originates in Travis Air Force Base and it goes to Hawaii and Guam and all these places. And they stop in Saigon and then they stop in Bangkok. And then they go to, uh, I went to New Delhi. Then I went to Lahore, Pakistan, uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, Madrid, Spain, Bermuda, and Charleston, South Carolina on this embassy flight. So when I was, I call up my buddy, whose picture I'll show you here in a little bit. He's down in Florida, down Sanford, Florida, and I got a I got a commercial flight from Charleston down to Orlando. I was the only only passenger on the plane, and he met me down there and. So I waited there a couple of days and drove up, picked up my kids and drove out to California. All these places you went, did you try the local food and oh, talk a lot to of the local did. people? Yeah. And... yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you couldn't ever go wrong in Thailand. They, all their food really was pretty healthy, pretty darn healthy. And uh, I went over uh, quite a few places in Thailand. I, I, one of my uh, memorable places was I went up to the bridge on the River Kwai, walked halfway across it, and it's nothing like the, the bridge in the bridge of the River Kwai. It's just like a typical old railroad bridge. Got little railings on the side. Went to the cemetery with where the Americans and the British and pay New respects Zealanders. to those. Yeah, there went yeah. through such hardship there. Oh yeah, jeez. And then uh, when I come back, I went back to California and joined MCB-11 and went to Vietnam for three tours. So a total of how many years did you spend in Vietnam? From what year to what year? Well, uh, I was there, well, we went on, this was our schedule. You go in there and you stay for nine months, a nine months tour, that's what you deploy to. And then you come back to the States and you're 15 to 20 days after you're back, you take leave or do whatever you want to do, and then you start going to school, training for different things and like that, and then you make a, another nine months tour. So I'd done three nine months tour in three years. Three years. And what was your job in Vietnam? What 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 kind of activities did you fill your days with? Building roads, ammo dumps, bridges, airstrips, landing zones for helicopters. What kind of equipment did you run? All different kinds of equipment. Anything that moves dirt. Bulldozers, graders, scrapers, loaders, you name it. Did you see action around there? Were there oh, battles we, nearby? We had, uh, most of the action was night when they hit us with mortars, you know. That, that was the biggest thing, you know. But actually to see people coming over the berm shooting at you, no. no. We had Marines all around us anyways. That's the reason I, I always tell these guys, I said, hey, thank you for, for the service. What kind of service? I said, for guarding us. Well, they were over there building paper places for you, you know, they just laugh, you know. So, but these, these guys are good down there. They, uh, they're really nice to me. And yeah. where, in, where in Vietnam specifically were you? My first tour was in Da Nang. This is all I-Corps. Vietnam is divided into six corps. I-Corps, which is first corps, starts from the DMZ and it goes down the coast of Chulai, then it goes second down towards Cameron Bay, Saigon, the Delta, and then down around the Delta. I see the five or six zones, and when somebody asks you, you say I Corps, or Five Corps, or something like that, they didn't know exactly where you, where you, uh, where you were at. Yeah, but we had CBs all the way from Chulai all the way up the coast to Da Nang, Quang Tri, Dong Ha, the rock pile, Kaesan. Yeah, we had all CBs stationed there at those places. And uh, there were mostly Marine bases. There's a couple of Army bases we stayed at, but most of them were Marine Corps bases. And in 1968, when the Air Force or the Army was getting um, uh, Cobra uh, helicopters, we were building uh, landing zones for them up there, uh, a base actually up there by Quang Tree Province. And, uh, this uh, army captain came up and said, would you like to take a ride one of these? I said, yeah, I sure would. And so he put me in it, got a helmet on it and all that, you know, and went up, took a ride and everything, you know. He said, now, when you look through that little scope right there in front of you, what you see is you're going to see a rocket hit it. I said, well, how do I do it? And he said, well, look down on the, there's a handle down there. Flip that little red button up, and if you see something you want to shoot at, just pull that right now 
and just keep your eye on it, and you'll see a rocket go down there and hit it. So up there in the river where we were flying over, there was a small island that they used for target practice, you know. And sure enough, they shot two rockets down there. <laughs> God, I felt so good about that. Oh dear. Yeah, it was uh, it was kind of hairy. It was uh, it was interesting because uh, the Vietnamese that worked for you in the daytime were VC at night. And we found that out a little bit too late when they when they had the Tet Offensive. Really bad, really bad. Yeah. So other than that, I uh, I retired from Navy March first, nineteen seventy one, forty one years ago. Have you 43. been back to Vietnam? No. Ever had any desire no, to go back? No, never had any desire. And besides, I mean, it's not cheap to fly there. I mean, you've got to pay through the nose. And the only bad thing about it is, when you go over there, as a, even as a tour, or even a bunch of people, they only let you see what they want you to see. Like if you say, well, I want to go to this base here because I was stationed there, that, that's not going to happen, unless it's a big base. And like, uh, the, the airport or, or something like that, a city port, but they only let you go and see what they want you to see. They don't want, they don't want to tell you how bad it was. Did you interface very much with uh, the Marines and the soldiers around there, the folks that had gone into battle, and and what was, what was your impression of well, those guys? Hey, they were great. I mean, it was. Uh, we never should have been there. You know, we're trying to save the French's butt. That's how it all started off at Dien Bien Phu, and that's what all, and we were trying to save the French. And then uh, uh, they were kind of getting overrun, so we were, they were going to help um, the president's name at that time. I think his last name was Diem, something like that. And he was as crooked as a, as a nail in the barn, I guess. And, but I think one thing led to the other, and we just kept pouring troops in there and pouring troops in there. We had over 500,000 over there at one time. I mean, on the ships and everything. You know, if, it is just like the same thing happened in Afghanistan and Iraq today. The politicians during the Vietnam War were telling the president what to do and what not to do. There was a lot of, when we first went there in 69, if, if we're out here working and there was VC across the road shooting at me, I couldn't shoot back unless I got permission from my, my senior man, the guy that was in charge of that. Well, that didn't happen with us. If some son of a gun shot at us, he's got a bullet coming right back at him, you know. And then finally they said, hey, we, we can't have that rule. And he says, no way. So I guess I was there about a, probably two months and then I'll change and say, hey, and they're open, open guns back there. Don't, don't, don't be afraid to shoot at them. So, but most of our tough, we were always surrounded by Marines or, or Army Guards. We, in fact, one of my biggest deal was when I was getting ready to leave Vietnam and January of 69, but I had about four or five days left in country, and uh, the DXO said, Chief Ryan, he said, go up and see the Alpha Company commander. He said, I got a job for you. I said, Jesus, what am I going to do? You know, I got, got to pack my bags, you know, and take my, get my booze that I can take back legally and all that. And he said, Chief, he said, I want you to go down and pick five guys right now, and you're going to go on a little little uh, deal up here at Quang Tree City. He, I said, what's that? He says, there's a, a track 155 or 175 track vehicle that had run off the road into a rice paddy. And you got to go up there and see if you can figure it out how to get it out of there. And I said, okay. I said, well, what am I going to use? He said, well, the Army is bringing by an Amtrak with some security guys with them and some workers. So you got five guys, got cables and blocks and all kinds of crap. We went up there and uh, we got out and made sure nobody was around there and nobody was shooting at us and here was this thing over the side of the road half in the rice paddy, you know. So I looked at the situation and I said, okay guys, here's how we're going to do it. So I raked up the cables and snatch blocks and all that, used the, the, the purlins and all that. And I said, okay, got everything hooked up. And I told the guy in that 155 or whatever it was, I said, when I nod my head, you put her in gear and you start getting your old trash going. And I told the guy in the APC, he said, same thing, when I nod my head now, you start pulling. And sure enough, the first time we pulled it, with all those purchases on there, it pulled that sucker right up out of there, got him up on the road, unhooked everything, you know, and 
the guy, the guys could, oh, that guy in that one fight, he couldn't thank me enough. He said, I don't know what the hell I would have done out here. And I said, well, that's the reason we're around. So that night, it was getting near near dark when we were getting ready to come back, and we were about, hmm, probably 12, 14 miles from the main camp. And we're north of Quang Tree City. So I said, well, where are you going to go? He said, geez, I don't know. I said, well, why don't you just follow this APC, because there's an Army base right next to the CB base down there. And I'm sure they'll put you up for the night. If not, come into the CB base, or we'll take care of you. And sure enough, <laughs> they come into the CB base, they stayed there with us at night. There was two guys in that uh, uh, big gun. And uh, next morning they got up, then they, they continued up to uh, Quavet, but it was up on the Quavet River. And uh, that was one of my big experiences, right? really showing them what CBs could do. Yeah. So, then after that, I came back and I had orders to Oak Harbor, Washington, and I stayed there a little over. I stayed actually up there uh, uh, 12 years. Got there in 69, left in 71. And I, I retired up there. And I loved it up there. The weather was nice. Everybody says it, it rains too much. It's overcast, have a lot of heavy drizzle, but not much rain. In fact, they get more rain in Denver than they do in Seattle. Yes, yeah. Just Plus, overcast more there. Yeah, more overcast. But I lived up on an island called Whidbey Island, right in the middle of Puget Sound up to the northeast. And uh, lots of times you could look down towards Seattle and you could see it raining. And you could see it raining over on the peninsula. But most of the time we would have sun. We went 94 days up there one time with no rain in, in Seattle, the whole western part of uh, Washington State. People didn't know how, what the hell to do about watering their lawns or anything, you know. <laughs> God used to take care of it, so they say, you know. <laughs> and uh, then that way, then uh, I, I would have probably would have stayed up there, but in '81, in Washington, the state of Washington, the economy is just like it is today here in Colorado. I mean, it, if you didn't work for Boeing, or the shipyard, or some government job, you could not find a job up there. That's how bad it was. In fact, what they did up there is they used to put up these big billboards on um, Interstate 5. The last person out of Seattle, please turn off the lights. And the governor, I think his last name was Evans, boy, he was up in arms over there. He said, hey, you know, we can't as if something like this in our country. But it was there. Once you left the service, what, what did you miss the most about it? What, what do you look back most fondly on? Oh... Geez, no, it's, it's hard to say. Like I, I told you earlier, I'm, I'm not afraid to talk to people, you know. And that was the same way uh, at, even after I retired up there. I, I worked with a good bunch of people and some guys I met for the first time and pretty soon we became friends. And uh, it's the same way down here. You know, I, uh, I never held back. If I thought, you know, I wanted to talk to you, I would. If I didn't want to talk to you, I wouldn't. I'd turn around and walk from over here. But I don't like talking to people that have a negative attitude. Or they don't look you in the eye. If they, I, I even have a guy that I used to work with. He would always, he would never look me. He would always look down. And I, and I told him, I said, USOB. I says, when I talk to you, if you don't look at me, I'm never going to talk to you again. I finally broke his habit. I got him to loosen up, but he was, he was like in a semi-depressed uh, surroundings all the time. He never thought anybody liked him or anything. They didn't think he did a good job. He did do a good job, but it was that attitude. And pretty soon, you got talking to some of the other guys, he turned out to be a good man, good worker. What kind of folks do you think, in talking about maybe how how your service, and, and more specifically with the Seabees, do you think there was a particular type of person that was attracted to working in the Seabees? Oh, yeah. You know, um, if they... If they'd uh, uh, advertise more what they actually did, we probably would have turned away thousands of people. But nobody really knew what they did. They didn't have a, a good PR man, you know. Uh, the, the only people that really knew about them, you, you either lived around Davisville, Rhode Island, which was a CB base, uh, Gulfport, Mississippi, another CB base, or Port Wenemi, California, which is another CB base. Those were the only three CB bases at that time that we had. We had a small ACB2 was down at Little Creek, but 
the big thing down there was uh, the seals. There was that's a big seal base, and they had a lot of amphibious ships in and out there. And then um, we had uh, CBs down in uh, in Coronado. A C B one was down there, but other than that, you know, if sometimes you went to shore duty, but you were a small contingent of people compared to it's like. Like up there at Oak Harbor, they, they had a CB detachment over there, probably 22, 24 people, you know, and they were a maintenance outfit, what they were. And then with all the uh, other people that was in the air squadrons up there, they probably had 38, 4,000 people up there. It, it was big, a lot of... Is there anything you'd like to, uh, you'd like to say or you'd like to talk about in conclusion? No, I, uh, I've enjoyed life since I was probably about 14, 15 years old. And I am just turned 80 years old two months ago, and I'm in, still enjoying life. And I'm going to do the best I can and as, live as long as I can. I have a wonderful wife to take care of me. And I have a good guy interviewing me. <laughs> That's Thank all you. i got to say, and God bless you all. <laughs> Memorial, out on Highway 40 and 6 in Golden, Colorado. And I'm, and I'm standing by the CB flag out there. And now on uh, the, eight, uh, the 28th of May, which is Memorial Day, they are having a... This is on the USS Donner. I was going from Little Creek, Virginia, to St. Anthony, Newfoundland, Cape Chetley, Labrador, Baffin Island, and Nassasarok, Greenland, for uh, a cruise up there delivering uh, supplies for the early, distant early warning program. This is a Da Nang EM Club in July 1966. And that young man standing up there with dark hair and a t-shirt on is me with a couple cans of beer in my hand. And it was a great day for the Irish and for the Seabees. This is me on a Saturday morning going down to the meat market Riding the local bus, which has probably been there for a thousand years, the way it rattled, wooden seats, no exhaust. But that was a good tour for me in 1955, 56 in Island, Malta. This is uh, my Class B EO school out in Port Wanimi, California. And I am that good looking young man standing on the left side of your camera. This is an ammunition dump that we just got uh, filled it, uh, filled, uh, filling it up and everything, loaded it up with ammunition, turned it over to the Marines, and after the day after we turned it over to the Marines, three rockets come in and this is what happened. We lost everything that we built. All, all of our huts, all of the ammunition went up. We found unexploded shells all up and down the highway in the villages, and uh, it was just really kind of sad for us because we put a lot of work into it.